the article we're going to discuss today, you kind of already seen because I was talking for ages without you being able to um, hear me. But it's this article here, uh, which is really kind of something I, I had never seen before. Um, when I, so when I first saw this article, I thought we, we kind of have to do it. We kind of have to do this one because this article is about understanding a chemical reaction not through any of the normal ways you might want to do that um, but through a completely different way so I'll, maybe I'll give it a little bit, bit more of an intro before we jump right into it although you can kind of see the you can kind of see the point on the screen if you guys do before I, I get started if you guys do want to um, read the paper uh, follow along with what we're doing here uh, you can get the link and the way you can get the link to this paper you could follow us on Twitter, in which case you'd already know what the link is because uh, I tweeted out this one, um, earlier today. But if you don't follow us on Twitter, then first of all, you need to do that. But second of all, you can get the link to the paper in the chat. And the way you do that is to type, is to use a chatbot. So a chatbot is normally reasonably well behaved, but every now and again, it doesn't work the way I want it to. So I'm going to test it out. The way you get the um, the way you get the link to the paper is to type exclamation mark paper. So I'm going to do that right now. And I think it has worked. Excellent. And then chatbot will reply to you um, with a link to the paper, which is awesome. So the best thing about this paper, one of the, well, a good thing about this paper is that it is what's called open access. So open access means that anybody in the world who has a um, internet connection, which I'm assuming that you guys do, uh, will be able to um i'm going to turn the music up a tiny bit because i actually can't hear it at all i don't know if, uh, i don't know if that's everyone else's but turn up a tiny bit hopefully hopefully you guys can hear it yeah okay i can hear it um anyone in the world with uh, internet connection can read this paper so this goes back to the whole issue of how how scientific publications work um which said many times before I'll probably say it many times in the video we should do a stream on that one day because it would be kind of fun but there's lots of different ways that uh, there's a weird kind of ecosystem uh, economy around scientific publications and the way it all works and it's deeply deeply strange and weird um, but the upshot of that is you can all read this article for free who knows how that happens uh, it's, it's kind of magic someone paid for it but that person is not you at least not done uh, so you might as well go and click because you don't, you don't save any money by not clicking. So you can click on this uh, this link. You can read the article for free, uh, which is great, and that applies to lots of lots of scientific articles these days, especially articles in this journal because this journal is uh, and it's published by the World Scientific um, Chemical Science is a completely open access uh, journal, so it's called a diamond open access. Lots of different kinds of open. Just saying open access isn't enough. You have to say something else. So you can say gold, or you can say green, or you can say diamond. And diamond is. Kind of best. I don't really know what diamond means. But diamond means something. Diamond open access means anyone can read it anytime. Um, so you might as well do it, because you've already paid for your taxes. Music's too loud. I thought I'd do it. Music should be down now. Okay, so so open access articles are great. Anyone in the world can read them. So you can click the link, and you can read along with it. Read along with us if you would like to. Or of course, it will be on the screen, so you can uh, just have a look on, on the screen as we read through it. So this article is about uh, um, something which is is kind of super relevant to anybody who studies chemistry or anybody who is interested in chemistry. But at the same time, it's kind of a um, a completely new idea which I hadn't really seen before so I thought this would be a nice a nice topic for this this stream so the anyone who's done a chemical reaction mix two things together seen something go fizz seen something go bang um, seen something change from you know slightly yellow to slightly more yellow that's kind of an organic chemistry thing um, will maybe have got interested in what exactly is going on. So often, if 
you study chemistry, whatever level you study chemistry to, whether, whether it's school or university or whether you're a professional chemist, we're kind of familiar with the idea that we, we try to describe what is going on during a chemical reaction. We try to just, you, you could call it the mechanism. People often call it a mechanism. So what is happening to the atoms um, during, a, during a chemical reaction? Which atoms go where? Which atom, which bonds are breaking? Which bonds are forming? What order do things happen in? And the reason we care about that stuff is because understanding that really lets us um, design a, a better reaction. The more we know about what happens during a reaction, the more we can say, okay, let's design a reaction to do a certain thing that I want it to do. Or let's make this reaction quicker or slower maybe in some cases, or more efficient. Um, so once you know about what, a, what, what is actually going on with the atoms, uh, you know what's happening during a reaction then you can you could you know you can start to invent your own reactions or you can start to maybe do reactions which nobody else has done before so there's loads and loads of ways that people have developed over the years to understand what is going on with a during a chemical reaction now it's kind of a I say this say this quite a lot but it's kind of an obvious statement but a really important one for um, for chemistry in general is that um, atoms are really tiny yeah atoms are really really small so um, a big problem with chemistry is that you can't really see what is going on on the atomic scale at least not with our normal senses but luckily chemists and physicists um, and engineers have over the years have invented a whole load of exciting ways that we can look into that atomic world and actually see what is what is happening on on an atomic scale um, so that idea that we really want to understand what's happening on the atomic scale during a chemical reaction is is a really old one and there's loads of ways to do that you could do that with um, low, different kinds of spectroscopy spectroscopy is a really a really common way to do that um, let's have slightly more relaxing music uh, spectroscopy is a really common way to do that and there's loads of different kinds of spectroscopy infrared spectroscopy NMR spectroscopy um, all sorts of other ones as well um, or there's, there's uh, other ways that we can kind of infer what's going on in, in, a, in a chemical reaction. We can uh, measure the structure of the, the, the products and we can try maybe to measure the, the structure of the, what species are, are present in the middle of the chemical reaction. And that can be a difficult thing because you know, chemical reactions are a, a dynamic process, something that's happening over time. And, um, May, it might happen very quickly and so we need methods that can um, uh, be very fast so we can have a, a high time a fast time resolution um, so we can understand what's going on you know on, on very short time scales um, but this paper presents a completely new way which I've never seen before of understanding reaction mechanisms so here they've got reaction mechanisms here in the title um, and the, the kind of reaction they're doing, it's still a chemical reaction, but it's a specific kind of reaction, which is called a, a mechanochemical reaction or mechanochemistry. So mechanochemistry um, is a, a way of doing a reaction, which may be a little bit, uh, seems a little bit unusual, but it's actually becoming more and more um, popular. Um, and that way of uh, doing chemistry is, or chemical reactions is grinding uh, your starting materials together. So you have two starting materials which are solids. It, they're often, they don't have to be, but they're often solids. Um, cool, okay, all right, thanks for that. You've had your volume on max. Okay, all right, but maybe you can't hear my voice now. I think it's the balance between uh, between music volume and voice volume that we, we need to optimize here. But it's, it sounds like you can maybe hear me, so it's all right. Okay, cool, I'm gonna carry on like this. If it's terrible, then let, then let me know. Um, so mechanochemistry is when you basically grind stuff together. Um, so normally they're solids, you can imagine you get two solids, you grind them together, um, apply mechanical force, that's where the mechano bit comes in, and you end up with a, a different product. So just by grinding together, you end up with do, doing chemistry. Now you can, I kind of mimed, you couldn't see on the, on the screen, I mimed grinding together um, by hand, but it doesn't have to be grinding together by hand. You can, in fact, as they do in this paper, it's much more reproducible if you do it this way. Um, you can um, use a, a machine to do it. So a, a typical machine to 
that's used for grinding is called a ball mill. So a ball mill is where you have kind of a, a container, nor, called, called a pot normally, which contains your um, reactants, and you put some balls inside, so spherical things, normally made of very hard material, or at least an unreactive material, and you um, agitate the pot, you close it, closing it is important, closing it is very important, you close the pot, and then you agitate it in some way, and there's actually a lot of technical words for how you can agitate the pot. You could shake it up and down, or you can move it round and round, that's called planetary, when you kind of move it round in like an orbit. Maybe you could call it circle, I don't know. Uh, planetary sounds cooler. Um, and the different, you know, so you could shake it vertically, shake it horizontally, do planetary motion, do a combination of those things. And the different uh, kind of ways that you agitate the, uh, the pot uh, cause the balls, which are quite small, to move around in different ways, and the balls will kind of impact with the side of the pot, and they will smash the, and you also have your, your reactants in there, yeah? and they will smash the reactants into each other, and they will kind of simulate or mimic um, that idea of, of kind of grinding. Um, so, that's the, the kind of chemical reaction we're talking about. So it's uh, mechanochemistry. And just like other chemical reactions, people are quite interested in what happens during mechanochemical reactions. So what is actually, you can obviously uh, you measure your products or measure your reactants that you put them in. You can measure the, the products that you get afterwards. You can open up it up and scrape the stuff out and do some analysis on it. But what's actually going on during the, uh, during the reaction itself? That's, that's very, very useful to know because that will help you, like I said uh, earlier on, that will help you to optimize the, uh, the reaction conditions, you know, to make the reaction better, more efficient, um, more, more energy efficient, maybe more time efficient. So there's lots of ways that people use to, to monitor mechanochemistry inside a ball mill. So most of those in, uh, revolve around having a transparent pot. So some kind of pot where you, um, some kind of pot that, that's made of a transparent material and you can shine light through or, or even just film what's going on inside with a high speed camera in order to understand what's going, going on. So by shining light in, you can do different kinds of spectroscopy. For example, Raman spectroscopy is a very useful way or, or uh, you might be able to do it infrared as well, but Raman is quite popular for this. Uh, it lets you, to, lets you understand um, about the vibrational properties of the molecules inside. So uh, you can use that to identify what molecules you have uh, inside your uh, inside your pot at different times during the reaction. So you don't have to open the pot and look inside. You can, you can measure this during the reaction. But this paper is introducing uh, perhaps a completely new way, or to me a completely new way, of understanding what's going on inside a reaction. And that is listening to it. That is listening to the reaction. So how does a reaction sound? Um, so I'm, I've never seen this before. Most of the ways that people study chemical reactions are to do with light, so spectroscopy, um, or to do with other kinds of uh, chemical analysis. But in this case, they're actually listening to the reaction and uh, seeing if they can correlate how the reaction sounds with what's going on uh, inside the, the, uh, the ball mill, inside the mechanoche mechanochemical reaction in itself. Okay, so let's have a look at this, uh, this article. So, um, as I said, I think I've already read out the title. This paper's in Chemical Science. Um, if you do want to find an article yourself, exclamation mark paper, and you will be rewarded by chatbot replying to you with the, uh, um, with the link, and you can read it yourself. So, this is from Cesar Leroy, I guess, uh, and co-workers, um, published just recently in Chemical Science. And so let's have a look at the, uh, the abstract. So this is the abstract here. We present a new operando approach for following reactions taking place in mechanochemistry. So operando is a phrase which means um, during operation. So during some, some way to, to look at a reaction while it's happening. Yeah, so some people use a, uh, use a phrase in situ. Um, some people use operando. I did uh, have a colleague once who, who thought that operando was, was, operando is a Latin word, um, but they thought that it was inappropriate to use in this context, but uh, I think that's probably a discussion for another day. Operando here means while a reaction is happening, that's all it means. 
So we present a new operandi approach for following reactions taking place in mechanochemistry, relying on the analysis of the evolution of sound during milling. We show that differences in sound can be directly correlated to physiochemical, uh, physico-chemical changes in the reactor, making this technique highly attractive and complementary to others for monitoring mechanochemical reactions. Most notably, it can provide unique information on the actual movements of the beads within the milling jars, which opens new avenues for helping to rationalize mechanochemical processes. Okay, so they're calling them milling jars. I think I called them pots earlier, but they're the same thing. Yeah, so they're the container in which this, this reaction is happening. And they call them beads and I call them balls. But as you, as you can imagine, they, they are the same thing. Right, so let me get rid of the, the chat because it kind of uh, it kind of goes over to the side. I can still see the chat on my screen. Um, if uh, you guys start start uh, um, chatting, I will I will by all means I will put the chat back. Right, let's have a quick look at the uh, the introduction. So the growing attention to mechanochemistry has led to an impressive range of research areas which these green synthetic methods can be applied. So they kind of put green in in. They put green in quotes. I don't know. So, so one of the ideas in mechanochemistry is doesn't use solvents. It doesn't use high temperatures. So it gets around a, a lot of the the bad points of um, of chemical synthesis, or bad in terms of you know energy intensive or not not particularly sustainable. Um, so that's that's the idea of green chemistry. So uh, green chemistry is a really important idea in, in chemical sciences. Is about doing reactions in a kind of sustainable in a, a less energy intensive way. Um, and that can make a big difference because a lot of uh, energy that we use as a society is, is, on, um, is on doing chemistry, on making things. And the, the chemical industry really supports a massive range of um, industries. You know, virtually everything you can think of, every consumer product that you buy has got some outputs of the, uh, the chemical industry. And so if we can make those processes greener, more efficient, less energy intensive, then that uh, can be big wins in terms of sustainability. Um, so green chemistry is really important. Mechanochemistry is a really can be a really attractive technique for as an alternative to standard chemical reactions because as I said it doesn't use solvents. Solvents can be um, uh, problematic because they can be toxic, they can be difficult to clean, uh, they can get released into the atmosphere which uh, or to the environment which can be a bad thing. Um, so the, the, the kind of green, the kind of quotes on green, I think mechanochemistry is a um, you know, a bona fide green, uh, green chemistry technique. Um, so ranging from pharmacy to catalysis as well as crystal engineering or material science. So there's a couple of um, citations there, a couple of uh, references which I'm sure will lead to uh, a, a, a few reviews or something like that about the, the range of mechanochemistry, but absolutely it's, it's increasing a lot. Although widely used for synthesizing elaborate compounds, the details of grinding and more specifically the physical and chemical mechanisms taking place are often seen as unfathomable. Unfathomable. In the case of ball milling, this is mainly due to the opaque and closed environment of the milling reactors in which most reactions take place. Okay, that's a quite quite a powerful uh, sentence. I think. I think the word unfathomable is uh, is uh, certainly provocative, isn't it? That, that some people, the idea that that scientists working on a reaction would just kind of give up and say oh it's it's kind of unknowable this part of my reaction is just unknowable and i'm not even going to try and try and work it out um probably a little a little unfair because people have i i would say you know working out the atomic mechanism for most organic chemistry reactions is probably a bigger challenge uh than working out how the balls move around inside a, a pot and that, that uh, you know, pe people didn't give up at, at the site scale of that challenge. But I, I know it. it's it's a good it's a good opening sentence, and it obviously sets up their uh, um, the rest of their paper, which is to you know prove that the unfathomable is in fact fathomable. So, in the light of the great interest in mechanochemistry, several research groups have thus strongly focused their attention on developing in situ as well as operand analytical methods. Okay, right. I'm going to throw my hands up here. I don't really know what they are defining as the difference between in situ as op and operando. So I, I kind of mentioned earlier on the operando, oh, operando just means in situ, but now they're, they're kind of distinguishing between in situ and operando. We're gonna need to get some Latin experts in here to uh, to help us out. If anyone knows any um, ancient Romans uh, on Twitch, then maybe you could just point them in this direction and we can work out what the actual difference is between in situ and operando. 
because I'm, I'm kind of stuck at the moment. Anyway, we have in situ and operando analytical methods in order to monitor reactions and observe evolutions in structure, crystallinity and or textural compounds involved during the milling process. So yeah, as I was saying, understanding what's going on during the reaction, kind of important, opens up a lot of opportunities, a lot of doorways for you to um, make things better, invent new stuff, discover new things, it's all good. Except for temperature, these methods usually require the use of transparent reactor material for Raman or X-ray diffraction monitoring, for example. So XRD monitoring, that's a really, another that very powerful um, in situ operando, who knows, uh, another very powerful technique for understanding chemical reactions as they progress. Um, X-ray diffraction tells you all about the crystalline material. So if you can see which crystals are forming, which crystals are disappearing, um, that's uh, exceptionally useful. But to do that, you're going to have to have to be able to shine x-rays in and out of your uh, of your material uh, of your reaction as it goes on so you're going to have to build them out of something that's specially designed for that also if your uh, if your um, ball mill your pot is your bowl is moving around very fast you're going to have to make sure your, your x-rays kind of follow it uh, that might be difficult i'm sure people have uh, got, got past that problem however several studies have shown that kinetics and or reaction mechanisms in ball milling can be greatly affected by the size and materials composing the reactor and beads, meaning the latter methods cannot be readily applied to different reactions without reinvestigating synthetic conditions. Okay, that's a problem then. So if you change if you uh, change your your bowls, your your equipment that you're doing the ball milling with, in order to allow you to do these uh, X-ray diffraction or Raman methods, then just by changing the materials you make your your balls out of. Um, will change the reaction conditions. So not really ideal, not really ideal. Um, several mechanical behaviors involving the bees and reactors have been shown to come into play during the ball synthesis. The reacting particles undergo direct impacts from the beads, as well as shearing forces, which can both lead to particle size reduction and the creation of fresh reactive surfaces. Um, they like the quote marks here, don't they? I don't know why that's a quote. They haven't cited it and therefore enable the chemical reactions to take place. Moreover, under some milling conditions, specific trajectories of the beads have also been identified, such as their direct back and forth movement from one wall of the reactor to another, or their rolling along the sides of the milling reactor. Such processes are generally difficult to predict and depend on numerous experimental parameters, such as type of beads, type of reactor, and milling parameters, and not to mention the type of movement imposed on the reactors by the, by the mill. Planetary, oscillating, vertical, or horizontal, there we go different kinds of movements as I, I described before, but also the physical and chemistry, chemical properties of the milled reagents. Okay, chemical properties is interesting. I'd be surprised if the chemical properties affect the movement of the, of the beads. You would expect that just to be a physical thing, but maybe I'm wrong. Various sounds can sometimes be noticed. Here we go, here we go. This is, this is where we get into the, the main part of the paper. Various sounds can be noticed during the milling of the compounds, which are test which attest off changes in the bead's motion in the reactor. Yet, although few previous attempts to follow the sound during ball milling experiments have been reported, and notably in 2004 by this group, to the best of our knowledge, only sounds resulting from the impact of a bead on the reactor were identified and analyzed. No systematic in investigation was made at the time on how the sound recorded could inform on other movements of the beads, nor more importantly, how it could be used to directly follow different physiochemical changes occurring in the milling reaction. In this context, we decided to record the sound produced by a vertical mixer upon milling in order to try to decipher the acoustic variations arising from different movements of the beads and how they can be related to changes in compositional physiochemical properties of the medium. Great stuff. Okay, so really nice uh, couple of paragraphs there, I think, um, explaining how they set this out. Uh, you know, the, the, the current ways of operando or in situ or whatever it is, uh, monitoring have disadvantages. You have to build the, uh, the bowl out of a certain material to allow you to do this, but by changing the material, um, you, you change the, the way the reaction happens. So it's not, you're not strictly measuring the same thing. Um, what they're uh, noting here is that by measuring things at a temperature, it doesn't require that. But also measuring the sound, in theory, you wouldn't need to change the, the uh, material of the bolt either. So that also kind of gets around this, this, uh, this problem. Um, you can kind of imagine how this, this idea kind of came up. You probably know, you know, 
the, these guys in the lab doing their um, their Borman experiments, and they kind of noticed, oh, okay, this kind of this sounds a bit weird, or this sounds a bit different to the last time I did it. Um, maybe they were even maybe they even kind of got used to the sounds that a, a particular reaction would make when it worked, or a sounds a particular reaction would make when it didn't work. Um, and they, they, maybe they realized that they, they themselves could recognize the, the difference between them. This is all my guess, obviously, it's hypothetical. Um, maybe the authors are in the chat. If the authors are in the chat, they can, they can, uh, they can tell me. Um, and then, you know, someone had the idea, why don't we just measure it? If we, if we can uh, hear it ourselves, if we can understand ourselves, um, the, the difference in reactivity based on the sound, why don't we uh, systemize that? Why don't we quantify that? Why don't we measure it? And, and see if we can produce something which uh, a, a new form of, of analysis and that's what I've done so I think it uh, sounds really good so they present three systems basically within this um, three different reactions okay but may, maybe first of all let's talk about their their reactors so if I zoom in a little bit on on figure one we can see um, the schematic of their let's scroll along a bit schematic of their reaction so so this uh, whoops so this guy here is their uh, let's get a different colour so it stands out a bit more. So this guy, whoops, this guy here is the, this is where the reaction is happening. Yeah. So this ball mill, this, this mixer mill is just going to shake up and down very, very fast. Um, and then they've got a few different probes. They've got four different probes, I guess, um, to, to monitor this as it's going on. So, of course, because we're talking about acoustics, they have a microphone so they can listen to the, uh, uh, they can listen to the, reaction as it happens that's the whole point of the paper but they've also got a whole load of other probes so they've got a Raman probe so they can measure Raman spectroscopy again this tells you about the vibrational property uh, linked up to the um, the Raman spectrometer here this kind of mini pretty small kit there they have a thermal imaging camera um, so they can obviously get the temperature and I think they do also have uh, a normal camera I think I'm pretty sure they do but it's, it's maybe not pictured here, or maybe it's the thing doing the picture, the, the, this photo, which will kind of make sense, I guess. Um, so they're throwing these different analysis techniques at it. The, the temperature, the Raman, but the important thing here that we're here to talk about is the, the microphone to measure the, uh, uh, to measure the acoustics, to measure the sound. They, they look at three different systems. So, okay, here we go. Here's the, here's the uh, schematic of this. So they have the Raman, they have the microphone, they have the thermal imaging camera. They're measuring three different systems here. So they start off with, let's go up here. Actually, let's scroll down. They start off with uh, this reaction here. Um, so they have these two compounds, which I will just scroll up to, uh, just to get the names of them. I mean, obviously I don't know their names. I'm just gonna, just gonna scroll up to get them on the screen. So they're, they're reacting these two, or yeah, let's say they're reacting these two compounds together. So this terephthalic acid and this compound here, which is called Dabco. Um, and these two things make a, a co-crystal. So co-crystal co actually is super interesting. We could actually do a many streams on, on just co-crystals. Co-crystals is where you have uh, two or more different molecular species um, and they together uh, arrange themselves to form a, a, a crystal, so to, to form a, a kind of repeating pattern. Um, understanding and predicting how co-crystals form is actually really important um, not just as a, a kind of fundamental problem in chemistry or in, in physics um, but it actually has really important practical applications especially in things like um, like pharmaceuticals so a lot of uh, drugs are given in the form of a co-crystal and that can be to make the, the drug molecule soluble um, under the right circumstances so by mixing it or by combining it with another molecule in the co-crystal you can change its, its solubility quite a lot so forming a, a co-crystal and understanding what co-crystals are going to form is uh, very important in, in um, uh, pharmacological work so, so making making new drugs basically um, great so uh, they, they first of all make a co-crystal of this material so they start with the individual materials they'll load those two they're both solids they load those solids into the into their bowl, they'll put the balls in, they'll close it up, they'll shake it, and at the end, they come up with a co-crystal. So those two molecules are combined together to make a single crystalline material, single crystal structure. Um, and you could work that out by using X-ray diffraction, it'd be the best way to understand um, whether it's 
uh, what, whether this reaction has worked or not. But of course, we want to do an operando measurement or an in situ measurement, whatever the difference is. So that's the, the first reaction. Maybe we will uh, have a look through that. This is a, an interesting kind of co-crystal. It's called an acid-base co-crystal. So if we go back down here, we can see the uh, terephthalic acid has these um, two carboxylic acid groups on there and we have these two amine groups in, in the DABCO. So obviously what can happen is that the um, protons from the carboxylic acid can protonate the amine groups here. Um, and in fact, that's what you have here. You can see a picture of the, uh, the crystal structure here. Uh, and if you look super closely, if I zoom in uh, to a, a high enough zoom level, um, we come across here. Yeah, we can see the, um, where, where are the nitrogens? We can see the protonated nitrogen. There's a nitrogen um, with the, the hydrogen on there. And you'll notice the oxygens here do not have their protons on. So this is called an acid-base co-crystal. Uh, there's loads of other kinds of co-crystals as well, not just acid-base. In fact, you, you can have um, uh, just neutral co-crystals that don't, don't exchange protons. And you can have acid-base co-crystals and you can have somewhere in between where you get some some amount of proton transfer between the uh, the two um, uh, co-crystal forming uh, species. But in this case, we expect in the, in the final product, you get complete proton transfer, protonation of the, these uh, amine groups here um, to make this diammonium molecule and uh, um, to make the, the, yeah, to, uh, to make this um, anion here. Okay, so let's, let's zoom out. So this is the reaction that they're doing. Um, and this is this is a nice figure too. It's a, a nice figure here. Let me just scroll along a little bit so you guys can see it. Figure two is a nice yeah. Figure two is a nice figure here. We can see the three um, different uh, analytical methods are kind of plotted against each other. So we have time going up from the bottom. So we have the start of the experiment here at the bottom, and the experiment progresses as we go up. So the Raman signal, you can see a change in um, in Raman pattern. So this is the original Raman signal. And you can see th this is kind of a contour plot or a heat map plot. So it's kind of like we're looking down on top of the Raman spectrum. And the, the height is kind of like in geography. It's the height of those, the color of those uh, different parts of the graph represent kind of the height. So I normally imagine it's kind of 3D. So the white is gonna be, they, they should really have a scale here, a color scale. Maybe they've mentioned it down here. Yeah, the scale goes from low blue to high red and then white, yeah. So white is the, is the highest um, the highest region here. Don't want to draw too much or it kind of messes, messes up the color. Um, so this is the, the highest signal here. And you can see as soon as the reaction starts, this very high signal starts decreasing. We follow it up here. This signal decreases and eventually disappears altogether. So just taking kind of a cross section, we could take a cross section down here. What we would see with time, let's plot time here. We'd start off very high, and then as the reaction progresses, this intensity will go down and eventually reach reach kind of zero. Yeah, so that's that's the cross section of this line as we go down here. Meanwhile, at a completely different frequency, we have um, a new line coming in, which starts pretty much at the time this one finishes, um, and this peak appears and then then just kind of stays at the uh, at this this constant intensity. So this is gonna be the, the Raman pattern for the product, and this is the Raman pattern for the starting material. So you can see this is this is the point where the, the chemical reaction happens. Interestingly, in this region, we don't really have strong signals from um, from either the, let me just rub out some of these lines a little bit close, clearer. We don't really have strong signals from either the um, starting material or the product. So this is kind of an interesting region. The Rama's not really picking up either of them, so maybe this is a region where the reaction is happening, things are changing from one thing to another. It's maybe the most interesting region of the, the experiment. And if we have a look at the temperature, you can see maybe that's borne out as well, because this is the region highlighted in red here, where the, the temperature starts to suddenly increase. So the temperature increases a little, a little bit as the balls start to spin, and then suddenly in this region, the temperature starts to, to kind of shoot up. So going not going incredibly high, going about as high as 40 degrees here. Um, so that correlates with the disappearance of the starting material from the Raman. 
but it also if you have a look at the, um, the sound which is kind of a weird thing to say for a chemical reaction if you have a look at the sound see this is a time when the sound starts to increase uh, the amplitude of the sound or the, 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 I don't even know the, the vocab to use the volume the intensity of the sound um, is, is increasing you can see a sudden change from this point here right at the start of this point where the, the product start the, the um, starting material completely disappears you get sudden increase in intensity of sound sudden increase in the, the temperature and both of those things finish pretty much at the same point so at the point when the product now appears in the ramen the temperature starts to decrease and the intensity of the sound also decreases very very interesting stuff so let's see what they uh they say about this I've, I've gone through kind of my interpretation just based on the um based on looking at figure two let's see what these these guys uh these guys are i'm going to zoom out a little bit so i can see both columns to save me um going uh going back and forth so during the mechanical chem chemical formation of the co-crystal uh that's what we talked about before and various sounds were noticed Careful analysis of the AF, so the audio frequency, I think, it's AF. Um, spectrogram revealed constants in signal intensity between 105 and 145 hertz and 145 to 155 hertz region. Uh, have a look in the supplementary information. We may, we may have time later, we, we might not do. I.e. close to the third harmonic in the milling frequency, which is 50 hertz. Notably, the increasing intensity between 145 and 155 was found to be significant found to significantly increase between 1,000 and 1,500 seconds of milling. So this is the red shady zone, exactly the zone we were just talking about, where it looks like from the Raman, from the temperature, that the reaction is actually happening. So that's pretty interesting. This experimental observation could be reproduced in the same time frame by repeating the experiment. Well, that's always good. Interestingly, when looking at the measurements recorded during the other operator method, uh, methods, an increase in the reactor's temperature by about 10 to 12 degrees is simultaneously observed using a thermal imaging camera. Moreover, the Rama spectrum recorded over the same period of time also revealed shifts in the, the DABCO and um, terephthalic acid vibration bands. Hence, these first results suggested that changes in sound can be directly correlated to the chemical reactions occurring in the reactor. Further analysis of the Rama spectrum was performed focusing notably on the zone between 915 and uh, 1050 wave numbers in which the DABCO uh, vibrations, vibrational bands appear. The latter vibrational mode was first found to shift from 970.8 to 984.3. Is this the region we're looking at here? Uh, yes, this is. Okay, so they talk about the shift in this band over here. Uh, it shifts to, to slightly higher frequencies. Um, where were we? Um, yeah, after around a thousand seconds of milling, and then to further shift to 1013.5 after about 500 seconds, which corresponds to the vibration frequency expected for the final co crystal. Okay, so that's they're talking about this shift, this initial shift to slightly higher wave numbers, if you can see here, and then the big jump to the final product here. Okay, so there looks like some kind of initial reaction is happening, the temperature increases, the sound increases, and then eventually we form our. We form our product at the end. Um, okay, to the best of our knowledge, this is the. Okay, sorry, we uh, I skipped out a little bit there. Um, although the exact nature of the intermediate has not yet been unambiguously identified, it can be tentatively consigned to this species, in which only one of the nitrogen atoms of the DABCO becomes protonated. Okay, so single protonation of the DABCO based on a shift in the uh, in the Raman observed in the Raman spectral speed leading to a single NH hydrogen bonding motif, NHO hydrogen bonding motif, in contrast with the final co-crystal, which contains two. Okay, so just to explain that, the, the co-crystal itself will be held together by uh, what's called hydrogen bonds. So these are bonds between, um, uh, that involve a, a, a hydrogen a proton, which is kind of between two electronegative atoms, one that it's formally bonded to. So in this case, if we protonated the amine, it's formally the, the proton is bonded to the, the nitrogen there and another electronegative atom that's going to be the oxygen in fact the oxygen that, that it just left when it was part of the, the carboxylate, carboxylic acid group here so then the hydrogen in fact exists kind of between both of those and helps to bind the two molecules the amine and the carboxylic acid together 
um, as a, a very strong kind of intermolecular force. And that's the force which is going to be holding the um, holding the, the two parts of the co-crystal uh, together. Okay, so um, they're suggesting that this intermediate is is when that happens to only one of the, the protons. So only one of the protons, this acid contains two protons here, when only one of the protons is transferred to the, the amine group, um, that's that's the a possible uh, identity of the of the intermediate phase. Okay, great. So, um, to the best of our uh, let's let's uh, go down here. Remarkably, the previously noted variation of sound around 150 hertz happens precisely during the short lifespan of this intermediate, i.e., between 1,000 and 1,500 seconds. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first time that evidence of the presence of reaction intermediates in mechanochemistry is accounted for by analyzing the sound occurring during the milling. Okay, so it is actually pretty a pretty remarkable correlation here between this period, you know, a very sudden onset of high intensity sound with the, the disappearance of the, the starting material, the appearance of this kind of intermediate and the sudden increase of temperature. So the way those correlate together, I think seems very convincing that this is a, a powerful method for uh, looking at these um, looking at uh, these reactions. Um, right, in order to help rationalize the origin of these changes, uh, the movements of the beads across the transparent perfect smelling reactors were visualized using a diff digital camera. In doing so, it was found that when the intermediate appeared, thus when the intensity of the sound maximum in this region, in this frequency region, the beads undergo a rolling type of mo movement on the wall of the reactor. Such motion can be opposed to the erratic impact of the beads which occurs during most of the remaining time and can be identified here on the AF spectrogram by the more intense inharmonic, uh, inharmonic signals between 105 and 145. Okay, and they've got more information in the, in the supporting information. It is possible that the predominance of rolling between 1000 and 1500 seconds may be caused by the significant changes in texture of the medium upon the formation of the intermediate. More generally speaking, to the best of our knowledge, it's the first time that an acoustic signature characteristic of rolling events in mechanochemistry is identified through sound measurements. Okay, so there, there's lots of firsts here. I think the first first that they talk about is, is maybe more interesting. Um, they, they're really, I think, really able to convincingly show that the, the presence of this intermediate correlates with the change in sound, correlates with the increasing temperature, which you know we can, we can be um, fairly strongly associated, I think, with the um, with the, the onset of this reaction, with the progress of this reaction, uh, this co-crystal forming reaction. Um, yeah, they're, they're also able to, with the uh, digital camera, with the optical camera, I guess, um, associate this change in sound with kind of rolling motion of the balls as opposed to shaking up and down. So the balls maybe roll round and round in the circuits as opposed to randomly bouncing around as it were. And that this may be due to uh, changing in texture. So I think really strong, they've been able to bring out really strong correlation there between the sounds they measure, the temperature, the Raman spectroscopy, and the movement of the, the balls to show very convincingly that this acoustic analysis for this particular reaction um, is you know, something that's valuable, something that's adding to the, uh, the operando measurement, the range of operando measurements that they're able to, uh, to, to use to understand these reactions. And as they say, it's got a lot of advantages over some of the other methods. You don't need a transparent reactor to measure the sound, you just need a microphone outside. Interesting that the, um, I wonder if this, uh, and they do, do show other examples later on, so there are other examples that, that, that this works, but a kind of an in initial thought that I had, they, they mentioned that it's a change in texture of the reaction mixture which uh, they think is responsible for this, the, the change in motion of the balls and therefore the change in the sound. So I wonder whether the um, a reaction which didn't have such a change in texture, you would you would notice such a big difference, if you see what I mean. So is it is it only the fact that maybe fortuitously, or maybe by you know a, a sensible choice of, of um, example reactions, let's say, that the, you know in this particular case the texture of the, the reaction changed a lot that changed the motion of the balls and that changed the sound. But maybe on some other reactions, you know, you, maybe you wouldn't have that. Maybe the texture wouldn't change during the reaction. Maybe it would stay pretty much the same. 
and therefore maybe you wouldn't have you know that those uh, such a strong signal with the sound but they do provide two other uh, examples later on so maybe we'll, we'll kind of skip ahead but I thought that was a really uh, a really effective demonstration a really nice figure here showing all the different analyses kind of side by side showing the same thing red shaded area very uh, very powerfully kind of delineates the, the, the changes you know in all three techniques I think works really well and a really nice way to to present the data there I think in, in figure two I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit they, they talk a lot more about this this first reaction um, definitely uh, definitely worth reading that in detail but they do present some other reactions which I, I want to cover as well or one of them is in the reaction actually but other processes um, that, that I, I want to uh, cover as well before we we end the stream so I'll skip ahead a little bit so overall throughout this first example we've been able to show how sound modifications can attest to the chemical evolution of the medium uh, inside the milling reactor I think probably they're showing a physical evolution which correlates with the chemical evolution um, but like I said, they might not always, that might not always be the case. They might not always correlate uh, so well. But anyway, um, so they talk about complementarity. In light of these first results, we decided to study on one hand whether other changes in the physical aspect of reaction medium could be correlated to variations in sound. And on the other hand, how sound me measurements may actually inform on chemical events taking place in the milling reactors in situations where temperature measurements or Raman operando analyses can be ambiguous, poorly informative, or not even applicable. Okay, so the first one of these is just a, a physical process. You're just looking at uh, uh, changes to the, the physical process, the physical properties, and how that relates to the sound. So, in order to investigate how change in the physical aspect of a reaction can be followed using the sound recording, we decide to study the hydrolysis of SiO2 initially introduced to the reactor's fume silica. So, fume silica, uh, I think, is just produced to um, a reaction of, oh, how do you make it? I think it's SiCl4. Do you make it with SiCl4 and exposing it to air or exposing it to, to moisture? And you form very, very tiny particles of, um, of SiO2. Oh, the sun, sun's bright there, isn't it? My green screen. Um, yeah, so I think fume silica is, is lo it looks like fumes because if you open uh, silicon chloride, silicon tetrachloride, you get very, very fine particles. It looks like smoke or fumes of this SiO2 and if you collect that up you get this um, uh, particular uh, very small particles of silica uh, and so you can buy that under the name fume silica. Um, so upon progressive addition of small amounts of water during ball milling, indeed as shown in figure three this system appeared to us an ideal for such investigations because it goes through many of the physical states commonly encountered in ball milling reactions. First a medium under the form of a light fluffy powder which upon addition of water forms more agglomerated particles leading to a heavy powder uh, which then further agglomerates and sticks to the beads leading to a so-called snowball effect. A subsequent addition of water allows the medium to re-spread onto the walls of the reactor um, and finally evolves towards a slurry type of texture. These changes were thus followed using a similar setup to the study of the co-crystal above so it's actually the same setup and let's let's skip to the results shall we because I think we understand uh, the idea here. So here we have another, I think, uh, a good uh, presentation of the data here, although this time um, maybe slightly confusingly, I don't know, not, not too confusingly, but um, this time time is going horizontally. So on, on figure two, the time is going vertically, now time is going horizontally, but if we can get our heads around that, I think we can probably understand what's happening. So they are, um, so if we have temperature here, we have sound intensity here, and at the top, they, they kind of show us what the, uh, they have some pictures of the uh, reaction at different stages, obviously after they've opened it up. Um, but it's not, not really a reaction, I suppose, but the, the mixture. So they take SiO2, they ball mill it for five minutes, and then they add 10 microliters of, of water, not milliliters, microliters. And then they just basically do that process again and again and again. So I think all of these um, kind of uh, dropouts here on the temperature and dropouts on the um, sound intensity are the places where they're opening up the, the bowl, they're adding the water and they're closing up and they're shaking again. Um, so you can see initially you get this um, kind of increase in temperature. Every time they, they open it the temperature drops so it kind of has to, to start again but the temperature kind of increases and the sound 
uh, you get this kind of evolution here, what they call light powder. Once you get into the snowball region, you start to get a much stronger uh, sound intensity. So I think this is this snowball region is, is maybe similar to what they were talking about in the, the co-crystal example above, where you are, um, have a, a, that, that kind of change in texture, and as you have the change in texture of the, the reaction mixture, or the, the ball milling mixture, in this case it's not really a reaction, um, you get this you know, quite dramatic increase in, in the sound uh, intensity. So that's really dramatic in this, in this kind of red region here. So you add more, uh, more uh, portions of water, you get this, this pronounced increase. And then suddenly uh, it, it collapses again, you, you lose your intensity. So that's kind of reminiscent, you know, the changes we had here. We had a very uh, sharp increase, very high int sound intensity for a long time, and then suddenly just drops off. So that could definitely be uh, transitioning in and out of this snowball region. So it could be transitioning from heavy powder to snowball, or even from snowball to sticky gel. Probably in the in the case of the um, in the case of the co-crystal we saw earlier, you were probably going from from the dry side into the snowball and then back out back to the dry side again as you you form the final product. But it could be the other way as well. Um, so they describe this a, a lot. Um, so I I think there's maybe some bits we can pick out, but I don't want to uh, read through everything because it will there's a, a lot of detail here. Uh, when analyzing in more detail the overall plot of the change in sound intensity around a third harmonic as a function of the amount of water, it's clear that the most significant increase occurs in a zone corresponding to the formation of the snowball. Great, that's just what I said. So this red region here, the snowball, that's what I thought too. Um, when the beads start rolling against the reaction walls and accumulating powder at their surface, most interestingly, when looking at the movement of the beads in this regime using the digital camera, a rolling of both beads in a separate zone to the reaction could, reactor could be observed as tentatively, tentatively illustrated in figure 3D. Tentatively is a great word for scientific papers. It basically kind of means you're making it up. Well, they're, they're not making it up. They're suggesting it, but they, they can't prove beyond doubt. So figure 3D here. So I think the, the rolling motion is here where the, the two balls kind of roll in, a, in separate regimes, in, in non-interacting regimes maybe. Um, when looking at movement of the beads in this regime using a digital camera, a rolling of both beads in separate zones could be observed. Oh, sorry, I read that part already. Um, a possible explanation to the related increase in sound would be that upon formation of the snowballs, the water of the reactor then become mostly free of powder, inducing such sound intensification. I see. So they're saying because the, the, the balls kind of clean in this regime, they clean all the powder off the walls, there isn't any powder there to kind of deaden the, the, the impact. Uh, that the balls make so uh, to reduce the sound intensity so um, that could be one reason why the the intensity increases uh, a contrario okay very nice more more latin coming in here call of romans again um, when the powder is homogeneously spread over the water the reactor as is in the case of formation of heavy powder um, the sound intensity is much more dampened okay so they're linking the intensity of the sound to the uh, the amount of powder on the wall. The importance of being able to follow the sound during the milling further appears when comparing the results of the AF acoustic frequency spectrogram analysis to those of the temperature measurements. In several situations, just like in the co-crystal system, the rolling events were found to be associated to temperature increases inside the milling reactor. As shown in particular after addition of 150 uh, of these amounts of water. So that's the red zone we saw earlier. However, changes in sound intensity around 150 Hz did not systematically correlate in the same way to change in temperature. For example, while temperature, uh, the temperature profiles after addition of these amounts of water were essentially the same, see the green arrows on figure three C, the sound intensity at 150 Hertz over the same period of time was very different. In one case corresponding to the milling of heavy powder, the other case to a snowball. Such results clearly demonstrate the complementary complementarity of acoustic and temperature measurements in trying to decipher the evolution of physicochemical properties the medium during milling. Okay, so the green hours, let's look for the green hours here. Okay, here are the green hours here. Okay, so they're saying these these cases you have pretty much the same temperature evolution. You know, if you're comparing these temperature evolution graphs, they'd be pretty much the same. But in terms of sound evolution, they're very different. So sound response, let's say they're very different. So it's, uh, let's erase this line here. And 
yeah it's it's these these lines here isn't it uh, this one matches up here yeah so so while they have pretty much the same gradient of temperature change they have completely different gradients uh, you know extremely different temperature gradient uh, gradients of change in in sound intensity so um, they're saying that this can be interpreted in terms of the uh, um, you know it shows that the, the temperature and the sound are telling you different things essentially telling you different things essentially okay so um, they do present a third example which is another kind of reaction uh, hydrolysis reaction in this case where again they present the, the sound intensity compare it with the temperature and uh, compare it with the Raman shift in this case as well uh, which I think adds, adds again to their um, to their case that the, the using the sound is, is really a, a, an important complementary um, technique for, for in situ analysis but I think we will uh, not have time to go over that last reaction we're going to uh, wrap up reasonably soon but I think uh, to summarize I thought this is a really nice paper I think it presented a, a very kind of logical argument um, uh, throughout the paper as to why this kind of acoustic analysis can be um, useful for mechanochemistry um, it's useful in that you don't have to adapt your um, your milling system you don't have to change the material of the bowl or the balls in order to do this you don't have to stop and open the reaction to do um, your analysis kind of part way through so it's very powerful in, in that sense and also it can identify different things compared to a uh, uh, compared to temperature alone so temperature alone uh, can tell you some things about what's going on inside a, a reaction uh, or a physical process in this case but the uh, the acoustic analysis can can add a lot to that story the temperature can't the temperature alone can't determine whether you have uh, the difference between different kinds of motion of the balls or different consistencies or different textures of the reaction mixture whereas the sound can be much in, in some cases much more sensitive to those those changes and I think they showed that um, very nicely here where the, the the dramatic evolution of the sound corresponds to the the, the, the point where the reaction is happening um, and they I, they don't quite go this far but I think it's reasonable to assume that the, the, the texture here is changing to this kind of snowball uh, may well be changing to this kind of snowball um, type uh, regime um, which is, is caused by a change in the in the texture due to the first protonation or the, the formation of the product after the first protonation is the, the aim in this case so overall I thought a really nice paper a really smart idea to take an observation that you uh, that you make in the lab oh this this reaction sounds a bit different and actually go all the way to to systematizing that to quantifying it to turning it into a technique which which could be used in, in maybe a much more um, kind of systematic or scientific way uh, compared to just you know listening in a lab saying oh the reaction's happening now I can hear the difference in sound so um, how applicable would this be to different things I mean mechanochemistry I think is the obvious arena where you can apply this but could this be used in other kinds of reactions could you set up a microphone you know next to a reflux or next to uh, some other kind of uh, more maybe more traditional chemical reaction that sounds a bit more far-fetched to me but um it might be possible you know uh, I, I think that the general idea of you know um, trying to make these observations and then turning them into um, systematic forms of analysis i think it could be applied to to loads of different things but for mechanochemical synthesis this analysis of uh, acoustic um, intensity acoustic frequencies and the intensity of different frequencies could be a really powerful method um, as I said earlier, I think they've chosen, you know, they've chosen examples where it works. Uh, so it'd be interesting to explore um, how prevalent um, this, the, these kind of changes in acoustic intensity are during mechanical chemical reactions. Do they happen in every every reaction? Do they only happen in a small subset? Do they only happen in, you know, very very uh, only in, you know, a, a very small selection of them? Um, that would be a good uh, good thing to to follow up to get an idea of you know, how widespread is this this one but assuming it's reasonably widespread I could see this uh, becoming pretty popular I mean it's not a uh, not a high barrier to entry um, you just need to get a microphone and some uh, a bit of kit to record on I imagine it's not too expensive so I think that could be a, 
uh, something that a lot more people yeah this is set up it doesn't doesn't look too complicated here so this could be something that could be easily implemented I think in, in a lot of labs okay I uh, really encourage you to go read the paper I think it's very nicely written uh, really neat idea as I said um, and um, maybe if you guys do mechanochemistry or you're interested in mechanochemistry this could be something you look into in the future all right we are going to wrap up there for today thank you very much for joining us apologies for the technical problems at the beginning of the stream if you couldn't hear me i'm sorry about that uh thanks to prospect fan for alerting me to those and helping me to uh, sort out the audio problems much appreciated um i will try to make the channel club a little bit more regular we had a little a little hiatus uh but hopefully we'll be back streaming several times a week uh, on, on different papers Follow us on Twitter, uh, I, I will tweet out the, the papers before. Uh, if you want to watch the previous streams, they are all uploaded onto YouTube, some highlights, or if you want to watch the full streams, you can do that. Uh, this one's available as a video on demand VOD on Twitch for a few days, a couple of weeks maybe, uh, before it disappears. But it will be uploaded on YouTube forever, um, including probably the bit at the beginning when you can hear me, although I may, I may edit that part out. Um, so thanks guys for being involved in the stream today. Thanks for watching uh, and I will um, see you on the next stream. Thanks a lot guys. See you later.